good to see you today. Thank you for taking time to make it out here to be with us here at New Home. We got a few more coming in. Come right on in. Glad to have each and every one of you. Appreciate you being here. I want to thank you again for being here. I want to remind you why we're here as we find ourselves in a spirit of worship, worship giving praise, honor, and glory to God Almighty. Let's raise our hands as we pray. Father, we love you for who you are. We thank you for the ability to be in your house. We thank you on this given day, on a Sunday that we're here. We thank you that we can make announcements of all the busy things that we're doing. But most of all, yes, most of all, we thank you that you saw fit, that you knew we needed a Savior, that we could not save ourselves, and you sent your Son. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the ability to give praises unto you and to him and knowing that he is the author and finisher of our faith, that our faith grows stronger and stronger as we see you work more mightily each day. And even when we are challenged, even when our days are disrupted, even when we have problems, temptations, struggles, Father, we know that your son is there beside of us. The Holy Spirit is working through us and many times in spite of us. So we pray right now in the stillness of these moments, we will find ourselves worshiping you, giving our time to you, our talents. And as we sing, as we read, as we study, and then as we partake of communion, it'll all be about you. We thank you for your blessings, dear God. They are so, so numerous. Too many to mention but we know that you are working. We stand firm on our faith in you, the Savior of the world. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me just ask you this morning as we get started, how's your faith? Hmm? Anybody? Good? Weak? Strong? Growing each day. That's a good answer. Well, would you consider your faith to be unshakable? That's the title of our message today, Having Unshakable Faith. How, how do we have that? And how does our faith grow? What do you put your faith in? Well, let me just say this morning you've already exercised some faith in some tangible things. You got up early and you turned the light on, right? You expected it to come on. Uh, you maybe went into the bathroom and uh, mirror caught you off guard, but you decided to take a shower, so you turned the water on. You expected it to come on, and you expected it to be warm right now, right? You had a little bit of faith in that, right? When you went to bed last night, you weren't worried about whether the light was going to come on this morning, whether you was going to have warm water. You expected it to be there. Well, even before that, you probably set a clock. To get you up, you expected it to go off. Sometimes when it doesn't go off and we don't get up, it's not our fault. It's the fault of the clock, right? What about your automobile? You sat down in it, you put the key in, you expected it to start up. You expected it to take you five, ten, or more minutes to get to church. You wanted to be here. What about the breath that we breathe? Man, isn't it good that we don't have to remind ourselves to breathe, to inhale and exhale? That's a different kind of faith. You see, all those things that we talked about that were tangible that you can see and you know happen each day, you might just maybe have some control over. But the faith that the Almighty God gives us through His Son, Jesus Christ, we don't have control over that. You see, He loved us that much to send His Son. You know, you got a little bit of faith in the pew that you're sitting in, don't you? Uh, wouldn't, you uh, wouldn't it be bad if you were fearful that the pew was going to collapse and you'd be sitting in the floor? Or if we didn't have pews? You got some faith that the AC unit's going to be running well on a warm day and we're going to be comfortable. 
you've probably got a little bit of faith and you're looking at your watch that I'm going to try to get you out of here right around noon so you can go eat, but that faith is faltering, right? I'll tell you what you do have faith in, and you should, that I, as your pastor, am going to bring you the inerrant, infallible, loving, and breathing, and alive Word of God. If I don't do that, then you need to get you a different pastor. You know, we can refer to these things as faith, but you know that's not really what we're referring to. That's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about faith in things that we can't see, we can't hold, we can't explain sometimes. We're talking about putting spiritual faith in God, a Savior, and a Holy Spirit. When we prayed this morning, we talked about the Holy Spirit being here with us and around us. That doesn't just happen on Sunday, by the way. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit is with you every day, all day, every minute, every second. Do you have faith that that's the case? The promises that Almighty God have laid forth for us in His Word should give us faith knowing that He never fails His promises. They always come to fruition, no matter what the circumstance. Faith in Jesus Christ who died upon the cross, who took the weight of our sins upon Himself that we could live a forgiven life. So grab your hymnals, if you will. We're not singing, but everybody needs a hymnal, so find you one. And once you found it, turn to responsive reading number 711. And once you found that, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to read the small print, and then we're going to read together in the bold print, okay? You hadn't done this in a while, so we'll brush up on it. Responsive reading 7-11. It says testimony at the top. Everybody got it? Okay, good. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the, truly, the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. For we do not preach ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Join me in a short prayer. Father, we thank You for this opportunity to read of Your Word, to proclaim it together as a congregation, knowing that it's not about us, knowing that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. No matter how strong or how weak it is, He is working each and every day that we may be like a cons consuming sponge that we can receive it 
and show it in the day-to-day -day walk that we live. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking part with that. Wonderful, wonderful passages, even found in our hymnals. So what is faith? Well, I like to say faith by the, by the letters of the word. Forsaking all, I take him. Who is him? Jesus. I trust in him. I trust that he came here, he lived a sin-free life, that he walked through the same problems and daily turmoil that you and I experience but yet He did it without sinning. That He laid His life down voluntarily, that He went to a cross and He died, but on the third day, praise God, He picked it up again. I have faith in that, do you? And I have faith that He lives at the right hand of the Father today because that's what the Word says. We read it in Hebrews chapter 12. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is evidence of things that we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. And it is impossible, let me say that again, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Let's look together at Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. If you're a note taker, and I pray that you are, and you write in the margins of your Bible, you'll probably see that we've read this same scripture at least four times and maybe a fifth time since I've been here as your pastor. It is a wonderful scripture because we are made right in God's sight because of Christ. And we stand on that word. Verse 1, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. It is important to point out here that Paul, who is writing, has been in chains. He's been in prison. He's been fearful for his own life. But nothing that touched Paul externally could cool him down or break his spirit internally. Meaning that nothing that pulls us off the path of serving God should break us to the point that we change inside. Our countenance may fail. We may look sad. We may look upset. Verbally and on our faces, you may be able to see it. But our faith remains strong because of Jesus Christ and what He did. Our faith does not falter because of our outward circumstances. Have you ever been in prison, chained to a prison guard as Paul was? Continue writing the Scriptures that we read today? That is faith. Let's flip quickly over to Ephesians chapter 6. Another good Scripture that we've shared many times talking about the whole armor of God. Now you may be sitting there, well here we go. Pastor's going to talk about the armor of God. I've heard this over and over. We're going to focus on the breastplate and the shoes and all these things. No, we're really going to focus on one thing, but it all winds up together. Talking about the shield of faith. Verse 10, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all. Don't miss that point. All 
strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. In the King James, it says to stop all the fiery fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I think Nick's got some pictures of a a shield, a soldier's shield. You see the shield there? He's got a couple of different ones. The shield wasn't something small and round like you see some armor bearers carrying. No, the shield of the medieval times was two to two and a half feet wide and nearly four feet tall. The shield was big enough that the soldier could hide his body completely behind it. The shield was usually made out of wood and it was wrapped with linen and then on the outside it was covered with leather or some type of, 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 of animal skin. And in the very center, very important, in the very center there was a brass plate. And that served several different purposes. First of all, the brass plate on the inside was where the handle was. And you could hold that spear. And then it maybe had some wrapping where you could really support it because it was heavy. But also that brass could be polished to be as shiny as it could be. And when you approached the enemy and the sun was shining, you could figure out how to just blind him with that coating of that brass. It was so bright and shiny. There was latches on the sides of the shield where the soldiers could hook their two shields together and get down on one knee and just form a terrace to protect themselves and those behind them. It was even said that after they formed that terrace on the ground, others would come up and put shield overhead so that no matter the force, it couldn't get to the soldier. The shield was extremely important. At night before the battle on the next day, guess what they did with the shield? They submerged it in water so that the leather would soak up the water And when the fiery darts came, they were no match for the shield and its water and its coating of leather. A lot of thought went into having a good shield. A lot of thought should go in to having our shield of faith. A lot of prayer. A lot of reading of God's Word. A lot of time on our knees. Gage, come here, buddy. Brandon, come here. Now, I'm fighting the wiles of the devil and I have my shield. Gage, get your shield on, buddy. Got your shield? Get close. Brandon, get your shield on. Hold it. We're fighting the wiles of the devil. Together. Not apart. Not separated. Tammy, come up here. Come on. Come on. We're waiting on you. You got your shield? All right, you piling here beside a gauge. You got it? Do you feel better with, without your shield? 
Do you feel good with all of us together? Edwin, come up here and get beside of Brandon. Buzz, get beside of Tammy. Roger, get beside of Edwin. We'll get one. Who we got? All right, get your shield. Fire darts are coming. Are we ready? You're getting bad news tomorrow at work. You're going to lose your job. Have you got your shield? Your kids are problematic at home. Have you got your shield? Stand up, rest a minute. You see, we're better together than we are separate. Stand there a minute. I've got something to share. By the way, Tammy said we, uh, we needed another shield bearer. Kathy, come help us on this end. Hurry. Yes. Well, you can't use that. That's not brass. It might be hard, but it's not brass. Listen to this as we close. From 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 13. This is the story of Elisha. He's in the wilderness. He's battling. This is, this is right after the floating axe head, if you remember that story. The king is upset with Elisha. He's coming after him. Verse 13 says, Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. Get your shields on, men and women. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Lynn, you feel like getting up? Amen. Get up. Get your shield on. Come on up and help them. Come on up and help them. Man, get up there. All of you. Get up there. Get up there. Get your shields ready. Who else wants to join them? Lisa, get up there with it with the Roger. Get your shields ready. Listen. Listen to what's coming. So one night, the king of Aram sent the great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant to the man of God, Elisha's servant, got up early the next morning, he went outside. There were troops and horses and chariots everywhere. What did he say? Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried out to Elisha. Elisha said, don't be afraid. For there are more on our side than there are theirs. Amen? There are more on our side than there are theirs. Got your shields? The Lord opened his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Had their shields up, their horses and their chariots. You feel strong up there? Do you feel dumb? But you're not. The shield of faith locks all of us together as one because we're all Christians believing on the same God, fighting the same external fo foes, but continuing to be strong inwardly. Y'all can sit down now. Yeah, you are, aren't they? In just a moment, we're going to partake of communion. And let me tell you something, and I don't want you to take this wrong, but in order to receive communion, your heart needs to be right. Your soul needs to be saved. And your conscience needs to be clear. I mean that with all sincerity. 
The Word of God says, do not partake of the blood and the body without being pure. So here for a moment, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to focus on anything in our lives. The sin that so easily trips us up. the things in our lives that we know aren't right. Maybe even some things that society says that it's okay, but you know in your heart it's not right. And you right now, just between you and your Savior, you ask for forgiveness once and for all. And you lay it down. Knowing that Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, forgives you and cleanses you and pushes that sin as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it again. He will not remember it, but you and I will. But at least at this moment in time, we are clear. You pray about that right now. Father, in the stillness of these moments, we are not worthy of Your love. We are not worthy of Your praise and the power that it gives. But we are certainly glad recipients of it. We do love You, Lord. We let down those weights of sin that hold us back. And we clear our consciences right now. Lord, when we leave this spot after partaking of your body and blood, allow us the strength to hold up our shields of faith and fight those fiery darts of temptation and sin. That we can not only be clean and clear this day, but every day, and when we stumble, Lord, help us to realize we have Christian brothers and sisters who are holding up that same shield of faith along beside of us as we're latched together in servanthood to You. It may look like that we are only a remnant, that we are only a minority, but according to your word, those that are for you outnumber those against you. And we will stand upon that word just as Elisha did. Father, now as we partake of this communion time of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us, I pray we do it in the right circumstance, knowing that it's all about you and not about us. Christ's name we pray. Amen.